to restart theater starting this Sunday on a two week trial. 60% seating capacity alone in the venue and of course other stipulations. For example, only four persons who are family can be seated beside each other. If not, it's after every two seat you place someone. Um, amongst other things. So we have gotten to go ahead, but also it feels very short notice because to give us a go ahead two, three days ago for this Sunday, when will you get time to have market that play, sell that play, reach out? And we're like, um, so am I still in a tableau or should I move on to our next scene? <laughs> That's how it really feels. Um, and I've decided, you know what? I'm just going to stay in a tableau and just see how this plays out first. Let this trial move on, let it happen, because also you don't wanna rush into something and, and create debt. Theater is a business, yes, it's art, but it's a business. So if I move too fast and I don't have the schools coming, because guess what? We're doing online learning in Jamaica. For CXC, for the exams, the, the, the fifth form exams, leaving out of high school, they now are doing in-person classes, but they feel rushed, they feel stressed. They have been doing online schooling for March and some schools with online, they weren't getting much lessons because they don't have internet, they're in a poor area. There's so much in that. So for these students now, they're on crunch time with exams this month, I think it's middle end of this month, so in a few weeks and they don't feel ready. Will a school want to still send them to a play when they're trying to crunch, an English literature play, when they're trying to crunch maybe eight subjects now in two, three weeks? So mm -hmm. as a producer, I have to think of all of that. So am I coming out of this tableau or am I staying for a while while I figure out my next move? Mm -hmm. So that's how where we are. It, yeah. So, how was it? Did you had to stay at home uh, you're not allowed to go out how how serious so, were the restrictions when did it start so it it we gradually after time kept having more and more and more restrictions so we started with work from home that was it we started with 10 persons alone in a space to be gathered and you have to be six feet from each other then we went to mask became mandatory from you're going in a public setting in a building in a vehicle, you had to wear a mask. Um, then we moved to curfew, 9 p.m. curfew at night, 6 p.m. in the morning, you get to come back out. And I remember there was the Easter holiday, we had curfew, I think from 2 p.m. you had to be in. Um, and it depends, for, for example, I can say I had a complete lockdown in St. Catherine. So St. Catherine had a case and other places in Jamaica, three other places, Bull Bay and somewhere in St. Mary had a spike in cases, a breakout almost happened. So we had a call center, a BPO, that we realized that many persons had COVID-19 and that happened in St. Catherine. So we were on lockdown for two weeks. We could not come out unless we're an essential worker. Mm -hmm. So we were only able to stay in the parish. Then we had it moved into, we only had two days to come out of our household, two days to go to the supermarket, to the, and we had to come out based on last name, initial. So Emma Walters, I think we went out on a Saturday only. That's where it went, to the mark. And then we had a time, like from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m., if memory serves. That was our time to come out of our house. And then we went back in and we stayed. And that happened for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. So the, um, some, so I remember Bull Bay, for example, their lockdown, I think, was even more severe. The government literally brought food for them. They could not leave their community at all because they had one of the worst cases. Um, the lady who came from America, I think she came from, or let me not say the country because I could be wrong. She came from overseas and she hopped all over Jamaica not knowing she had corona. Went mm. into a funeral and it was a big breakout. That was our first case. And that sent the country in panic because everybody was, was she around me? Was she in my parish? Was she in my community? So it was a lot. So, so now we're still on curfew, but we are a little later with curfew. Like it's 9 p.m., 11 p.m., depending on midday, weekday. Um, and we, we St. Catherine, for example, now I can go to other parishes. We're there now. We just reopened our border. We just reopened tourism um, recently. And there are debates about, is that too quick? 
we are now, our cases are imported and by opening tourism, we are bringing in more cases. But then the reality is persons need to earn. Yeah. And tourism is a main money factor for Jamaica. Sure. So that's the whole island debate going on and whether it is upset because as well with entertainment industry not fully opened, some of us are a little bit, if more cases are coming in, will it be shutting us down longer? So that, that worry is there too, depending on the industry that you're in. So that's what it is like right now in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And um, has it been successful? Um, is COVID, uh, how strong are the cases? How many infections okay. or deaths you have? Um... All right. So we have 715 confirmed cases so far from all the case. islands, 700. All the, all the island. We have 560 recoveries, which is good. So that's 78.3% recovery very good so we does have we only have 145 cases right now so we see progress and we're like let's not move too fast and open the borders please let's not have a second lockdown um but we're doing very good in regards so if we look at the statistics mm -hmm. we are doing good it's just for jamaicans to take it seriously wear their mask practice social distancing things like that so we because we have to play our part our part too and Jamaicans listen to the government they followed? Uh, uh, um, not quite. Because I've, I've been out and seen social gathering and I'm just like, what? what? I'll share. Recently, I, I was taking a stroll in my community and I saw two kiddies party and I was confused. So what I say to my friends is, Corona is a myth. Something is wrong with me. I, I have something wrong because when I pass and see a kiddies party with a pool, what mm. so things like that worry me and as a government of course it's so hard to monitor all of that um i think beaches and rivers are open but with strict stipulations like they close at 4 p.m and social distancing as well 10 persons and monitoring of the beaches have been going on police have been there so that's how they're doing it to ensure that persons are practicing um, the, the social distancing that we have implemented as a country. Well, it sounds like a successful um, um, uh, uh, strategy and such a low number of cases. Of course, you're in a way an island is a little bit more right. protected. You don't have like New York City, there are 6 million people taking a subway every day. Mm -hmm. you know, a million people coming in and out of uh, uh, train stations and uh, New Yorkers are so close, live so close on each other. So um, everything that makes the city so great it worked uh, against us here so um, but I think New Yorkers also listen well and that people are worried uh, how long can that stay yeah um, so um, <clears throat> so for for a theater company uh, in Jamaica what is how does uh, how does the daily work look like and how is the how is theater in Jamaica is it part of a community is it part of um, the fabric of society are you at the center what where does it come in um i would say i would, there are pros and cons in there so I, would, I say we're in the middle so yes we are part of the community and yes we are loved but there is also the debate of some persons may think for example if i say i want to do theater persons are like mm? you know want be doctor or lawyer <laughs> so there there is also that um that person that maybe the respect of it as a profession. Mm -hmm. um, so we're still building that. But even though that is there, there are persons who, of course, love it and respect it and see the value. That's why I would say we're right in the middle mm -hmm. of that. Um, a daily, for theater, we rehearse, for example, when I'm doing my plays, I rehearse six weeks for a show. I know some persons rehearse eight weeks for a show. Some persons rehearse three weeks for a show. So it really, on standard, standard is normally six weeks. That, well, that's what we're trained to do. Mm -hmm. um, and running your play just depends on your product. So for example, my product runs for a month, while some theater company run for three months, six months. Our theater season is normally on boxing day, it opens. And that's where most plays happen during that time. I tend to do March because I, my, my company is aiming for our CXE exams, which are in June. So I try and do mine in March to be closer to the exam period where kids need that refresher of the play 
before stepping in that exam. Um, we have about, wow, well, I was about to say we about how many playhouses we have, but now yesterday I'm hearing that there are a few playhouses that are closing. I heard about three playhouses in two days and I was like, wow. They will be because of Corona, they- um, That's, I'm, I'm, I haven't really researched. Mm -hmm. I haven't asked us yet because I know that it's, it's, a, it's a hard time. So how many, tell us some names of the theater and how many, roughly how many theater companies so have, or theater buildings? So let's go at the buildings. We have the Ward Theater, which is downtown that is under construction at the moment. One of our longest theater. It's one of our biggest theater as well. Um, we have the Little Theater, which hosts our national pantomime. We have the Little Little Theater, which is right beside that. We have Edna Manley College has their own theater. Then it's called you went to theater. study? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, University of the West Indies, which is a college, has the Philip Sherlock Center as well. That's the next theater. Very nice lighting there. Love their lighting. So that's four. Um, Cargill Avenue, two theaters are there on that, in that vicinity. So that's what? I'm at seven, six. Um, Phoenix is now closed. And someone just opened one, the Johnny Place. That, that's a small theater holding like 140. So we have about seven spaces so far. Normally persons use school auditoriums or just any auditoriums out there as well if you want a bigger space. And especially when you're going across Ireland because all I've just listed is actually in Kingston. Montego Bay has one theater, which is very small. Like I can't remember the name right now. Fairfield Theater, that's the name. Um, so most of our theaters are in Kingston because Kingston is a center of entertainment and life and all of that. That's where we go for all of that. Um, but once we go out of town, persons normally use school auditoriums or you find a, a venue that you can erect a stage on if there's not one and carry a light. Sometimes it's going to be outside theater once you move out of town. Yeah. That's, that is quite, uh, quite amazing. So um, in this time um, of Corona, did you... Um, did you rethink, do you say, what am I doing? Uh, is there a way where you say, what is essential? Are you rethinking the form uh, of theater? What you, what you will be doing? Um, are, yeah. you, are you influenced by this time or do you think it's going to, it's an interruption, but it will, we will continue what we did before? Definitely, I, re, I had to rethink a lot of things. Not just me, we had that discussion even, I keep up with a part of that discussion we we're having on Kingston Creative. Um, that's, that's uh, what I, how do I explain it? They're a nonprofit group, a nonprofit artistic group. And they had a discussion last, what was it, May? About theater post-corona. Are we gonna be the same? Are we evolving? What do we think? So for, before I go to that, firstly, I'll say as an entrepreneur, as a creative entrepreneur first, I had to rethink. I'm still rethinking a lot of things because I'm still observing and seeing, especially with my clients being school students, I have to see what's happening in that industry. What's their way forward for me to adjust my product to assist them as well? Because that comes from the Ministry of Education. I have no say there, that's the government. So what I love about, what I have to say for me personally, what was great during Corona, I was a part of a US embassy entrepreneur, female entrepreneur program called the R program, Academy for Women Entrepreneurs. And Corona literally came during that time when I was doing that, doing that program, doing my um, business plan all over revamping what I have, looking at my services. And I'm like, okay, this is a good period to do this right now. What is our way forward? The discussion in um, Jamaica at this moment, we're looking at virtual theater. So Jamaica didn't, we haven't really been doing that a lot, mm -hmm. if at all, to be honest. I'm going in my mind to see who was doing it before and I, nobody's popping up. So now with Corona, we're looking at, hmm, are we gonna stay right here and not earn for maybe a year? or months, or are we gonna look at virtual online theater? And that's been a discussion that we have been having. One person moved in that space already and did something on Father's Day. I know, for example, a comedian who is also a theater practitioner, he has moved his comedy shows online and it seems to be working very well. I, we've also been having the discussion of TV, that's where I was looking, still looking. 
that if this continues, I will bring my shows to TV for students to watch. Because what Ministry of Education was doing back in March and April, they were looking at um, learning from home and they looked at TV programs. So they created a lot of TV shows for students at home, preparing for CXT, preparing for um, sixth grade exam, which is called PEP. And we just look at stuff. So I said, hmm, if we're continuing this, let me do this. I believe TV will fit my product better than online. Because then I'm competing with all the Tempest and the um, To Kill a Mockingbird shows on YouTube. Why come and watch me when I can go on YouTube and watch that free? <laughs> so then we started to talk about TV. We also started to look at, talk about radio. Are we going to beef up radio dramas at this moment and get our products out through that avenue? So that's the discussion we've been having in Jamaica, just as theater practitioners. How are we surviving during this time? And also what the, the methods we're using to survive, will, there be, will, will those methods be used even more post-COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And is there government support for you? How is it? organized in Jamaica, the theater. Boy, you just touched <clears throat> something. You just touched something right there. Oh, Lord. <laughs> um, we're still trying to foster that government support. And there, there are many, many reasons for that. For example, theater, we still don't have an association. We start, we stop, we start, we stop, we start, we stop. Um, so we don't have that bridge between industry and government. Yes, there are other other arts have arts um, forms have their associations. So the government did in March, April, I think it was in April, they did a care package where they assisted financially Jamaicans across the board, tourism, who are unemployed, this, that, that, that. But the entertainment industry, we didn't have a package for ourselves. There was a package, I can't remember what, what the title was, but for that package, anybody who didn't fit the other criteria could apply. And that was us. And that was the lowest money there was. We just fell in that. We just fell in the Jamaican who maybe was always unemployed. <laughs> um, in the, so, so it was tourism, um, businesses who lost money or had to close doors could apply for that as long as they pay their, pay their taxes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you're not paying your taxes, you're, you're not going to be in that. But and then employment, unemployment was a part of that. If you're with a company who is un, who is no longer in operation, yeah. But at the end of the day, most theatre persons being freelancers, not being full and fully employed, fell in the category of the least money. So that was that also was a debate in our industry. Is the government supporting us? Are we gonna get some support at the end of the day? Here we are waiting. Hey. Um, so that is still there. I'm still hoping that they would, but I guess that's why they opened up a little bit earlier for us in mm -hmm. July now to say, hey, we can't assist the way we want to assist. But mm -hmm. here's a green light to go. And you have health insurance uh, through <clears throat> as a health insurance uh, for artists? Is that in the um, US? Artists don't have that. So, uh, how is that in no, Jamaica? No, I, we don't have specific to artists. It would be that as a company, I would not reach out when I have full, em full time employees to get health insurance for them. But I have n I'll be honest, I've never had the health insurance as an artist that, that from a company. That'd be something that I would have to do for me. Mm, yeah. Extra, yeah. So we're still developing as a country when it comes down to the theater and the structures that we need to put in place. We're still developing. We're still learning. We're still having that conversation to put things in place so that artists are comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Akiba, um, as a question for you, I think you, you grew up um, in Jamaica and then you went to the US, you know, work here in theater, you're so deeply involved in the Boston area. Um, how, what, when you think about uh, Jamaican theater, what, what comes to your mind? Pantomime, laughter, and language. 
um, I migrated to the United States at nine. So I, that's a very tender age where you're starting to get a sense of self in the world as a child. Um, the benefit, one of the great benefits for me is that when I left Jamaica, the culture was just saturated. The arts were everywhere. Um, theater was very, very prominent, very live. Music, we in the Caribbean, and you'll see this also in South and Central America, the arts, at least when in my memory, you know, and now I have to keep reminding myself I'm 30 years removed from Jamaica. Um, so I'm probably more American than I am Jamaican today. But um, so a lot of my memory is a child's memory, but the arts weren't separate from, they were not in categories. It was, it was one and it was a way of seeing, being, and knowing who you are. Um, a question of access, just so many things that I experienced in the United States as an artist, we didn't, we didn't really have that. The arts in Jamaica, theater in Jamaica, reggae, dance, all of it, the national dance, everything. It was as prominent as the sun, the sea, and the sand. And so I left Jamaica at nine with the dream of becoming an actor and you know, going on to, to Hollywood. And I used to beg my parents to move to LA, move from Boston. I've lived in Boston my entire time in the United States. And I used to beg them, let's go to LA. That's where I can be an actor. And all of that dreaming really comes from watching Leonie Forbes and Dr. Barbara Grudon and Oliver Samuels and so many of our legends who I just never, I just kept them with me. They're like tattooed into my being. Um, but a, one, one thing to understand also about Jamaican arts, whether you're talking about theater or you're talking about dance or you're talking about music, the arts holds this epistemic memory and history for us. So there's just a lot of learning. If you see uh, in 2018, I was in Jamaica, I went to see a production called Romy and Julie, which is a, an adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. It was done by a company called Jambiz. And Jambiz is one of the lead, it's actually the leading um, theater company, repertory company in Jamaica. They work out of center stage in Kingston. And I think that's on Cargill Ave, Evene? No, Dominica Drive, New Kingston. Dominica, that's correct. Yeah. So they are in what's called the um, corporate area or in, in New Kingston. And just to kind of translate some of this for us in the States, um, New Kingston would be kind of like a midtown, you know, somewhere between um, downtown and the financial district, you know, so it's, it's, it's where the, the, the middle class and the upper middle class reside and play. So um, if you have a theater in that area, you're, you're pretty, pretty prominent. So I went to see, um, but what this company does is they premiere their plays in Kingston and then they tour the plays around the island. Um, so where I saw the, so that what they'll do is they'll have two companies. They have um, a company in Kingston and they have the touring company and the show is running in repertory. Um, so I saw it in one of the um, parishes outside of um, St. Andrew. Uh, is the parish Clarendon? <laughs> Gosh, I feel bad. I should know that. Yeah, Did yeah. Call Clarendon. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I was in Clarendon and um, and saw it, and there was about it was in a park, and there was I felt like there were three thousand people there. It was packed, and there and it went all through the night. But what I loved, I, I know Romeo and Juliet very well. It was this adaptation. I'm watching it. I'm thinking, would something like this work in Boston? Do we have the audience, et cetera, et cetera? What I loved about the production was how much that production was not, how, how Jamaican it was. It was their story. Um, it was adapted to the, 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 the culture and the geography of that land. And to be honest, I, I looked at, and it was a lot of family. It was late in the night, but it was a lot of families. And as I looked at the children in the audience, I thought, what are they going to remember from tonight and how much of this story um, are they going to feel is not theirs? 
And the challenge, the, the difference in being in the US and the transition is entering into a world where you're told that certain stories are not yours. Um, it's interesting because Evan A talks about doing The Tempest and um, doing To Kill a Mockingbird. And um, if you look into the history of Jamaican theater, even going back say 50 years, 40, 50 years, um, you will see that storytelling is, um, there is a, a, a continuum without borders of stories. Um, there aren't, these are the European stories. These are the white stories being put on by black actors. These are the Jamaican stories. That doesn't exist, at least in my experience. Um, theater is theater, acting is acting, storytelling is storytelling, and they find a way to, to fit the form to speak to the needs and the well being of the audience. Um, and, and, and for me, as a person who identifies as Black in the United States, it is, um, it's, it's refreshing to look into Jamaica, to look into Jamaica now, to look into Caribbean countries now, to look into African countries at this time, um, to see how the art is, is being made and how the art is speaking to the people. Because in the United States, as Black people, we're told our place. We are told what is our story, how we should tell our stories, who we should tell our stories to. We, we are penned in. We're penned in like animals here. Um, so when we, myself and my business partners, go to Jamaica or go to St. Lucia or Tobago, or if we're in West Africa, we feel so free. We can watch Shakespeare and not feel like it's not ours or that we're watching it through the lens that we are told to watch it through. It's so different. So that's where our, um, our connections with these motherlands begin for us, this wanting to um, attain a freedom that our brothers and sisters in the Caribbean and in Africa and the continent have um, that we don't always have. We may have prominence and position here in the United States. We many, Frank, you know that the mm -hmm. theaters, the nonprofit theaters just turned over and it's leadership. And we have many people of color in positions of leadership and, and prominence and, and access. And, and, we're, and, and, and those people are doing, doing the job and they're doing an excellent job and they are making a way um, and they're making their way and they're challenged, but they're forging forward. Um, but it's still in a box. It's still, we're still penned in here. We're still told how we have to be. And when I look at a place like Jamaica or, or particularly the English speaking Caribbean, which is, you know, colonized at, at one point, we were colonized by the Portuguese and Spanish. Um, but then we, the, um, 4th of July, we talk about 4th of July, um, we were then colonized by uh, the British. So that's why we're, we're English speaking Caribbean. But and you would think that in, in areas like that, that are just so based on manners and structure and parochial being that the arts would also be as penned in and it's not. It's probably penned in um, in its business structure, which there are so many opportunities for growth. And what I love about these communities is how interested they are in, in learning certain business practices that may, um, and not just, I, I should say, and communi communications practices that can just enlarge their, their, their coast. Um, and then to, to move away from this us and them, I don't like the us and, us'ing and the theming of people. Um, but what we're interested in is, is, is one of the beauties of Corona is this kind of me melding and mushing of borders. Um, yeah, we see the borders close here and there, but people keep on trampling over that. We're trampling over it right now on the internet. We are, you know, there are pigeons flying from here to Jamaica to send messages. There'll be no borders. We're, 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 we are interrogating this notion of borders. And 
we are in a, in, in a time where we're told to stay inside, close the borders, protect ourselves. We have the privilege of this interrogation right now. And that is, I hate to use the word bridging and, you know, because these are common and they're cliche, you know, we're bridging, we're make, bridging. Make. I think we're talking to each other. And we have to. We need you, Evane, and people in Jamaica and people in Haiti. We need to hear from the people in Trinidad and to get, we need to know how you're surviving because they are crushing our bones in this country. And we need to know how you're surviving. And you need to know how we're surviving because we're surviving. We're surviving. Yeah, we're surviving. We're thriving. So I don't know if I've moved too, how far away from the question that you asked in my um, expressions here, Frank, um, but that's the connection with a need to reach out and to know, just like you have done, Frank, how are people doing? How are people doing? How are they surviving? And that one, us wanting as black people to know about where, where we are in this world. Mm -hmm. How was the experience for you as a, you say, black woman, also a Caribbean within the black community and the woman or in, in America? How, is your, how was your experience in the world of theater in the US? Well, I found myself, um, I like the term that Evan A uses, the tableau. The tableau is a very active moment, an active scene, very mm -hmm. active scene if it's done well. And um, yeah, I, I resonate with the tableau. I resonate with the tableau. But I'm kind of like a child in a, in, a, in a grade school production in tableau who can't keep her eyes still. So everything's frozen, but I'm like, you know, looking around. Yes, yes. You know. I can see that. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know it's watching your in this tableau, but what's next? Yeah. What's, what's my next yes. line? You know? So After that's it. happening, right? Yeah, all right, that's good, that's happening. So how is it for me? I'm gonna answer as honestly as possible. Mm -hmm, please. I know I, I'm finding myself in a seat of privilege. I'm in Boston, in Massachusetts, one of the um, more liberal states in the United States. Um, we have a lot of liberties here. We have a lot of privilege here. We have challenges. We are not without challenges. We have challenges. I'm also employed at a very culturally responsible institution. Um, at Art Emerson, we are committed to making theater for all. We are committed to putting the world on stage. We are interrogating our history. Um, within the industry as, as, as people, we are questioning ourselves. We are standing and facing racism. We are an anti-racist, anti-white supremacist institution. And we know that even being in that position, like that's a tableau, a very difficult tableau to hold at any given time. Our, leadership, the, the college is, is led by an African-American man, Lee Pelton. The institution is led, uh, Art Emerson is led by both an African-American man, David House, and um, a Caucasian-American, David Dower. And we are facing ourselves and we're facing each other and we're working in the continuum. So for me, I am very privileged and lucky to be where I am. I'm at Arts Emerson in Boston, in Massachusetts, in Northeast um, America on the Atlantic Ocean. I have clouds. I could send you some rain, Evan A. We have rain, <laughs> you know, and you know rain is a blessing. So there is, I was shocked at the beginning of the outbreak. We, we left work on March 11th. We have been quarantined since March 11th. Um, and we would have weekly team meetings at Art Emerson. And um, in addition to weekly staff phone calls, just to see each other's faces. And the first month we just kept saying, myself and my colleagues, um, Susan and Kevin, we just kept saying, um, wow, we are, 
we were feeling it, but we were feeling it, at least I was feeling it in the position of, we, we have a job and um, right, our job, our, our, our leadership, the leadership of our theater is fighting to keep us all whole. They're not looking at where they can cut and where they can lay off people and where they, they've asked us, um, they have done everything in their power and they are doing everything in their power to keep us whole to keep us whole. So for me as a black person, sometimes I, I haven't fallen under that narrative of suffering, but I'm not unaware of that suffering. I'm not unaware um, of, of, of the fact that there are co my other colleagues who are not in the position that I'm in. And that, um, that, that, that gives me just a moment to pause. just to hold that in. I kept saying to my colleague, Kevin Becerra, you know, I felt bad in the first few weeks. So I'm not feeling any pain because as a black person, we have survived so many apocalypse. You probably heard this from other theater makers who identify as, as black people in these talks. We have survived so many apocalypses. We're practiced in the art of surviving and moving on from apocalypses. The apocalypse of the Middle Passage, the apocalypse of um, being placed and misplaced and replaced on plantations, apartheids, the apartheids across the black world, whether you're dealing with Jim Crowism or you're dealing with um, apartheid in South Africa or any, any levels of separation and breaking of our bones. Um, so there was a part of me that's just like, I feel bad that I can't feel this pain because I'm calloused when it comes to suffering. There's a lot of calluses, so I don't feel this. So that was, um, that's, that's how I was doing for a while. And then I started reaching out to to, to Jamaica and to some of our other Caribbean colleagues and, and, and hearing, and then listening to your series, Frank, which has been very helpful, very wow. grounding, very grounding. Um, then on top of all of this, I've been concerned about our narrative. Um, what, on top of all of this, we're, I've started a, a brand new company inside of this apocalypse. Um, and the last apocalypse was, which was the, um, the crash, uh, the financial systems crashing in 08, um, that signaled the kind of the decline of our last company, Up Your Mighty Race. So that company started to, to really struggle because a lot of the commitments to us as a nonprofit, the first to go, um, the financial commitments. So during that apocalypse, I wasn't in this position. And so I, now in this apocalypse, I'm in this position and I'm like, I can't believe I'm, I'm here and I'm not suffering this time. I am not suffering. I have food to eat close to where and, a, and, and my dwelling places are, in, are intact. Wow. So what are you gonna do next? Start a new theater. <laughs> and we said, um, before the, um, the COVID, we, myself and my colleagues, uh, Natasha McNaught and Magalie Neff, we were envisioning um, a production, a theater production company that would create um, large scale works that would tour. Um, and then this happened and we looked at each other like, okay, that idea is dead. We, we're not gonna be, no one's gonna pay us any mind. Every, you know, this is over. And then we looked up again at each other and we said, but what about the stories? What about the narratives? What are they gonna say about us? How are we gonna emerge as a culture, as a people outside of after COVID when everybody is back and whole and so we said, well, we're gonna keep going. We're gonna launch a company in the middle of a pandemic where no one can travel and it's gonna be international. 
So where do we start? And we decided, so I'm gonna speak a little Jamaican here to walk chalk line. <laughs> Evan is smiling, walk chalk line, right? My mom always taught me, she said, you know, you need to walk the chalk line, which means um, she would say, poor, the poor man's children walk the chalk line by themselves, the rich man's children walk in a gang. And what that means is um, she was a poor woman, so she couldn't bail me out. The rich man's children can do what they want because he can bail them out. So they can be in gangs, but you will walk singular, you will walk a chalk line. And we've decided that our chalk line is the story and the narrative. And so we're gonna hold on to that line and we're gonna walk through pa this pandemic and we're gonna build our vehicle our theater and we are going to make connections and we're going to hold on to this this yearning this need to find stories that reflect us as we see ourselves not in opposition to any other groups any other cultures but as we see ourselves where we're opening our eyes where we're healing where we're feeling what is our story how do we see ourselves what do we call ourselves what is ours? What part of Shakespeare is ours? What part of this one is ours? What part of that one is ours? Who are, who are our playwrights? You had the great Woody King Jr. on about two weeks ago. <sighs> that talk alone is lesson because Woody King said it when he said, you know, it was about reflecting back to our people who we were and how theater makes us feel, makes us feel about ourselves. So we decided that pandemic or no pandemic, we still got feelings and we gonna talk about it on the stage. So I'm well, I'm skilled. I'm nourished. And I'm ready to, to feed, to serve. And we, and we are, Natasha, Magali, my partners, Evan A, we are ready. And we wanna, we, we, wanna, we wanna know each other. So this is such a great platform that you have here, Frank, that we can, we can say this and talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Right, Evan A? <clears throat> yeah, actually, I love where you're going. I wanted to add something about um, a discussion happening in Jamaica. You were part of it, um, Akiba, when we were doing the Kingston Creative Talk, that one of the conversations we we're having is what's happening to live theatre. And I realized that there was some anxiety with theatre practitioners, what's happening to live theatre, because live theatre is also our lives. When we look at the art and what we want to do, we love being with the audience. We love being on stage. It nourishes our soul. And there was anxiety persons like, are we saying post-COVID, it's, it's, it's more virtual, it's less, it's, it's less live? So and when Akiba was speaking, that, that came back to me, our identity in the space, what we identify with as our home in the space and live theater is very important for us um and of course we had to re we, in a discussion we have to look at it and say that's just our fear and someone said it best i can't remember his name fully which is my lecturer my past lecture which is very bad he said theater was there before us yes theater will be there after us michael record yeah michael record when yeah. mr record I said it i said yes sir you said it the best and is anyone listening right now with that anxiety in your soul wondering what's gonna happen theater was there before us theater will be there after us we're just having a pause right now with us and sometimes we need to look at why we need to pause whether as a country whether as an artist whether as an individual find your why in the pause yeah man. my why is i need to really look at certain things business wise we are growing. I need to be growing in certain ways. How can I grow? What's the help I need to do? My past is also spiritual stuff. There are many healing things I have been doing during Corona, looking at how I need to honor me better and how that's leaking into the company as an entrepreneur. You can't have certain issues you need to work through 
and think that that's, that's not going to affect the company. Simply put, I'm a workaholic. Sometimes I don't sleep and I get very miserable. That's going to affect how I communicate to the staff. Simple things like that. So in this pause, find your why in your company. And it kind of, yeah. for me, what I had to work through with Corona, this is weird, but I'll be honest. I went through failure issues. This is why. I felt as if I failed my staff, which is completely irrational. It's a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I had to work through that. Here it is that you were to do shows and to earn a salary. I hired you for this period. We've been working. I need to honor my part now. And I can't pay you. Mm -hmm. That was hard for me. I almost went in depression because of that. I had to heal through that because I take that very personally. Why? I've worked with persons already who have done shady business. And when I started RTV, one of the reasons why I started RTV was to increase money in my industry, increase employment, because we have what I call industry migration. Mm -hmm. We have persons who study theater, but when you leave school, you can't find a job. So you go to a next industry because you got to survive. So when I became an entrepreneur, I'm like, hmm, I want to ensure that persons earn. That's what I'm about. And you know, that's something I'm very proud about. I'm about that. You're going to earn. Yes. And then Corona comes and I'm like, oh, okay. All shows are canceled. I can't. Wow. I can't pay. Wow. And that hit me very, very hard. I had to work through that. And that's a... I, 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 it took me like a few weeks, but I worked through and I, I felt better. And I have to say, we got my, we got that cast. They're so loving. They're so amazing. Even today, I was telling them about the talk and they were like, yeah, they're so amazing. But just to carry it back, during this pause, just figure out what you need to work through. Whether it is that you're growing your company, are you doing individual work, or are you doing artistic work? Now is that time to look at how can I strengthen my skill? Because you said it. Akiba, I'm skilled. Okay, I'm a director. In this period, how can I keep growing that skill? That's what we have to be looking at. Okay, I'm an actress. In this period, how can I be better? What are my weaknesses as an actor? Oh, I don't listen enough. Mm, my nuances, oh, my beats. Mm. You, you take the time now and be like, okay, let me look at this script, The Tempest. I'm like, let me look at beats during this time then. You know, that was my last production. Let me look at that. So now is the time for us to grow. So right when the doors are open for theater and we all as a world can start to be on that stage again, our skills are so sharp. Yeah, you gotta we are ready for action. So that's what I want persons to think about. Evane, as you speak, you make me realize one thing. We're not in the time of famine. For the majority, there are very few countries that are experiencing a famine. Sure. We will be fed. We will have uh -huh. food. There are, you know, there, there's food. Um, there are people who, 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 who may not have access directly but there's food if you if you if you put your head out your window and say i'm hungry i gotta eat i didn't eat breakfast this morning i am hungry you're gonna get food you need food you need proteins carbohydrates fats and fiber you're gonna get that you're gonna get some shelter there's shelter out there there is there are opportunities especially right now people don't want people on the street so there even if you got to come outside of your comfort zone and beg and be uncomfortable for a little while, you will have shelter and there's tons of clothes. Anybody looking for clothes? Mm -hmm. I got bags of clothes. So we have food, clothes and shelter. And it, you just, by you saying now is a time in the pause and a lot of, one of the challenges that, that I've had is in the United States is feeling that not having the pause, not taking the beat, not taking the moment, not mm -hmm. staying still in the tableau when the teacher said, stay still in the tableau, don't move your eyes. Um, we're just moving, we're moving to this movement, we're moving to that, we're moving to, you got food, clothes, and shelter right now while the world is sick. The world has a thermometer under her tongue. We are all sick. Practice your beats. Mm -hmm. 
do some tongue twisters. Get or if you're if you're a producer, find a way to find yourself. Look at your skills. I think we when you when I heard you speaking about that and skills and and pra what do we practice at any stage? What do we hold on to? What do we perfect? What do we what do we practice? Because I don't like the word perfect. Um, I thought, well, people got to eat. And then the thought was, ain't nobody hungry. We're not in a time of famine, to my knowledge. Maybe there are famines. And right. I, I get what you mean. Um, insensitive to places in the world where there are famines. Sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps, still is the okay. only place. Yeah. Yes. Right. Lots so of has changed for the good in the world, yeah. Yeah, there is, there is a famine. There are famines happening there. And um, just sending the right level of awareness and positivity to those areas in the world. But in Boston, we don't have a famine. In Kingston, we don't have a famine. We can be fed. In New York, we can be fed. Um, we're in, if look around, it's about being aware of what is available to you at this time. Can you start anything? Can you start a business in the time of a pandemic? Can you write a play? Can you, can you, can you choose to, do you, can you afford to freeze in the tableau? Yeah, because some people can't. But look at the um, what is available to us. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I started. The minute this thing hit, I went to my old friend Arto, grabbed the theater and its double, and read the first um, ten pages, which is where he talks about the plague showing up in Marseille, and 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 interestingly. The, the, that whole um, the boat the, the the ship showing up in the in Marseille and and being turned away all of that happened as I was reading it it was happening in Jamaica they were turning away the the cruise ships with all these Jamaicans who wanted to return home because they because of the the, the borders were closed so I, I go back and I'm reading through our toe and you know you can't just read our toe one time you got to read him over and over because he's dense and um, and he the moment where he talks about just going back to what you said um Evanay, about theater before and theater after us there's a moment in there where um the, the this cruise ship that is um infected with the plague or believed to be infected with the plague is um looking for a new port and um the 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 minister the 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 um ombudsman of the the old port um, is, you know, kind of taking some heat for sending the ship away. And then news comes that that ship, the, the Newport accepted the ship and the plague broke out and he gets this and then all pandemonium broke, breaks out, but his port, he had denied the ship from coming in. And he then gets this moment of praise and, and a lot of conversation around him. And Arto says, it is at that moment that the theater begins. You know, it is, it is at that moment that the theater begins in the middle of the morass, essentially, yeah. in the middle of the pandemonium, in the middle of the mess, in the clamoring marketplace, in the middle of the confusion, the tableau, the fray. It is at that moment that the theater begins. And so what is the theater that is beginning now? What Don't do you think? Look, what is it? What do I think? What do you, can I throw that to my sister first? What is the what theater I, that is beginning now for you in Jamaica? Um, whew, like I said, we're talking about virtual. Um, I think honestly, it's gonna be new things growing. Persons are gonna start thinking out of the box. How can I do things different in this space and what is different? So I may not have specific what is gonna be because I think each person is gonna each person or groups are gonna birth different things in this space right now. That's what I think. And so we talk about the evolution of theater, the growth of theater. If we look at birth, it takes stillness as we would say, a pause, a minute, whether it's chaos, whatever to create something. And that's what I think is going to happen. Whether it's virtual, whatever it is, or a whole new art form, but let it come forth. Now is the time. For me, Frank, and for um, my colleagues, Natasha and uh, Magali, and for my colleagues at Arts Emerson, um, the entire team, 
the theater that begins for us now is a theater of a theater of justice. It is a theater of um, reparations. reconciliation, a theater of sincerity. I don't want to say truth. I say sincerity. Every move, it's a sincere move, a sincere action. It is a theater of um, claiming and forming and writing a new story. And we have an opportunity. I've heard this in the talks and I am going to echo it. We have an opportunity right now to decide. And when I say we, I say the we of mankind, what the story is going from here on in, moving forward. Frank, when, when I reached out to you to suggest some speakers for the talk, you were very specific. You said, just make sure it's not male heavy. You're a man. That is the theater of sincerity. That is the theater of the story that you did. You intentionally said, let it, it could be women or it could be a male and woman. I don't want to talk to male heavy. Because that's, that's the theater before the crash. True. That is not the theater of repair. The theater of repair says that we, we pay attention to who's in the room, who's talking. And that you, 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 you say, I don't want to talk to male heavy. Make sure it's not male heavy. Get a, you know. Normally, a talk like this would have the, 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 the people with the highest level of visibility, right? And so the way the world was before this crash is because there was no one to say, make sure it's not this. So um, that's the theater of now. That's the, the saying, you're not just saying, well, we're diverse and we're gonna represent all the voices and just get me, get me the hottest people out of Jamaica. Get me the hottest people out of, you, know, you said, you were specific. So that's, that's the theater. That's, that's the moment where the theater begins. This is the moment where the theater begins. When, when, when people um, who have access can be intentional about increasing access for people who don't. That's the theater of now. To make sure that all our stories are heard. And I hope it's also a theater of empathy that we move forward in the world with empathy, or else we're gonna keep on repeating and repeating and repeating. And just, it'll be a rehearsal, that's it. Just a rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it is clear that, um, Things have to change, and I think perhaps they 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 already have changed. We don't, we haven't fully seen it yet. And um, and Frederic, who uh, joined us on Wednesday, who said, you know, mankind was shocked when it found out that the Earth is not at the center. That we are actually flying around the sun. They were shocked when Darwin said, you know, we are connected to the animals, the monkeys. Now we say the climate change will kill us, you know, we have to see that we are part of a system and we have to listen to everyone, the plants, the animals, but also to us saying yeah. we are no longer ourselves. The, at the center, there are lots of actors. She called, that's why she likes science in theater. There are lots of actors. We have to pay attention. They might even invisible, not even through a microscope, you can see a virus. And I think that, that um, awareness somehow has has to be reflected, but it's, you know, easily said, you guys both also do do things and produce things and uh, 
What inspires you when you look at contemporary theater work or performance work? Where do you get inspiration or ideas? Well, for me, I kind of am always looking for medicine. So we have um, commissioned our first piece called um, The Bar Girl of Jamaica. And um, it's a work that we're developing. It's not slated to premiere until 2022. Um, and there were just so many, as, as a person in the diaspora, um, as a person who understands just some of the history around the island of Jamaica and how it impacted the world in general, there were moments, there were points in the story that I said, oh yeah, uh-huh, that's good. That's good, that's remedy, that's, that's good. Yeah, uh-huh, okay, we can work with that. I just, so I keep looking for, I feel like I keep looking for ingredients, like a, 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 a herb woman, a bush woman. I'm looking for, for medicine, things to draw, to draw some kind of tea with, or some kind of thing you can post it. I don't know, I'm gonna say the word properly, but the point is I'm looking for medicine. So when I look at contemporary theater, I, in my generation X or being, I'm looking for something that can heal the open wounds of people who were impacted by the transatlantic slave trade. So I'm looking for things like that. That's what I'm looking for, no matter what, who's writing it. If I think I can use that to heal these open wounds, then I'm going to try to make it, um, expound on it and make it get to the people. That's what I'm looking for. Medicine in the language and the form, um, connections to the past and the, and, and, visions and understanding of the now. Yeah, I look for medicine. That's yeah. Evan <laughs> Um, I second that, but I go even deeper. If it's me, and especially if I'm writing, um, I want to say me and me outside of the company on a personal note, I like to look at ways how persons don't give other people choices. I always say we want to have choice, but we want to take away choice. I like to let people see those aspects of themselves on a stage when they say, oh, me, I am not like that. And then they see the action and go, hmm, that feels familiar. I felt like I did that last. Oh, wow, I didn't realize I did that. That's the kind of theater I like. I call it the in-your-face kind of vibes. That's what I call it. And that's what I like to write um, about and see on a space. Just how we are oppressing each other in mm. our society on an everyday basis, okay. whether it is race, sexual oppression, whatever it is, in yeah. every way. And, and that's what I like to do. I like that. that. That's what I, and I think for me, that's when it comes from my spirit, when it comes from my soul. I also like to say, to show persons how spiritually unaligned they are, just walking as unaligned people, just oppressing, taking away person's choice, taking away their voice, take, just taking themselves away from them. Mm. I think that's the cruelest thing you can do to an individual. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's quite uh, something. So, um, Akiba, for you, when, where did you study theater or where did you get your education from? Uh -huh. and where did you, and how was that experience for you in the U.S.? I started studying theater at the Strand Theater in Dorchester, a 1,400-seat vaudeville theater, a roadhouse where the, the, the um, Tyler Perry, uh, David E. Talbert plays would come through, as well as the Boys Choir of Harlem and Grover Washington Jr. And um, at one time, it was the, the Boston stop for Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington. So I started studying um, theater there as a uh, practitioner. And then I went and received some academic training at the University of Massachusetts at Boston, where I was, I was in a very privileged class. Uh, we had a, a, a gentleman named Lou Roberts um, who taught me directing. And Lou Roberts was from 
the that error of um, New York um, working with you know in, in in the 50s and the 60s with with all the greats that um, uh, doesn't come to the tongue but is on my mind right now um, and so for example Lou Lou was so severe man we had to wear a uniform to class <laughs> had to wow. wear a uniform to to directing you know if you were accepted in his advanced directing class um, he had he had some severe rules about him and me from Jamaica I loved it growing up wearing uniforms all the time I was like yeah I'm gonna be serious about this so from there so I worked with some I definitely was in a great class at UMass um, in that era there was Diane Almeida and Ron Nash and just some incredible master master theater makers and then from there I started up Umati Race I actually started up Umati Race as a, a um, Tasha and I started it at UMass um, as a directed study and um, they gave us credit for it and then the community loved it and then we decided to grow the company. And around 2007, um, I decided that I wanted more training and I went to La Mama where I trained um, in the director's symposium with Ellen Stewart and um, Andre Sherban, Yoshi Oida, um, just some incredible, <laughs> Petar Todorov, some incredible um, practitioners Eastern European, some folks from the Peter Brook Company. And then I went back in 09 and um, trained with Daniel Banks and um, Daniel. Who, the, the power, I just want to just lift up Daniel Banks for a moment. Daniel, yeah. What Daniel taught us, Daniel, Daniel opened his session by saying, if you are going to do work that impacts young people, you must be close to them. You must listen to what they listen to. You must know what they know. You must eat what they eat. You must know hip hop. <laughs> I will never forget that session. And it was, and so he, he, he did a whole session on, on hip hop drama, but positioning it um, outside of the recording industry and more as a, um, as a, a, a way of life in a way of life that if we were going to be theater makers and we were going to be um, pedagogues of the form and we were going to be teaching artists and we're going to save the world and all this, that we had to come at it um, from a, a very um, flare position. You had to let the, the form teach you. You had to let the people teach you. So the, the lessons learned from Daniel and Daniel and I remained friends over the years. Um, it, it, it took all of that kind of really, str you know, stringent, academic, you must, you must do this, you must do that. And then it, it applied it in a way um, that I think is more, more sincere and more useful um, or just as useful. Um, I don't like hierarchy in anything, mm -hmm. I don't like hierarchy, so, okay. So that's that. And then, so, you know, so my training comes from, so the, the, the kind of academies or institutions would be the Strand Theater, UMass Boston, under the leadership of, um, of, of Lou Roberts, may he rest in peace, and, um, and then La Mama, under the leadership of the great Ellen Stewart, my yeah. mama, may she rest in peace. I spent a lot of time with um, Mama. If, you, if you've ever been around Ellen Stewart, you spent a lot of time with her because she, yeah. she is the epitome of a sincere being. Um, she was uh, a gift to this world. Um, so that is, that is my training. And then my training is every day, you know, so I'm about to do some training in Jamaica. We'll see what happens. <laughs> what are you going to do in Jamaica? So we're, um, we're actually starting with a series. Um, one, we're, we're going to be developing Bar Girl in Jamaica. We're going to do a residency at the University of the West Indies in um, 21, 2021. And then linking that residency to a couple of theaters in the United States. Um, and then we are more immediately, we're launching a series on August 16th called 10 Weeks in Jamaica, a Theater Conversations from Jamaica to the World. Um, and there we're going to be speaking with practitioners um, from the legend, the legendary founders, the people who are linked to the legendary little theater movement. The little theater movement, just to translate a little bit, is similar to the regional theater movement. Um, the Little Theater Movement would be analogous to the arena stage in the United States, 
and and with in in a just to kind of position it. Mm-hmm. Very different, but just giving my American listeners some some perspective here. Yeah. Um, but it was a, a very intentional movement that was. Um, and then it, and then went on to the little little theater movement, um, which the little little theater would, movement would be similar to to what happened with the off Broadway off off Broadway um, mm-hmm. transition there. And um, Jamaica's history with theater dates back to the 16th century, uh, where it was the pastime of the gentrified, the plantocracy, the plantocracy, the people from Great Britain, the governors, etc. And then, interestingly enough, in 1911, George Bernard Shaw visited the country and um, made statements to the press about, you know, essentially how oppressive the theater scene was in Jamaica and um, how it, in order to decolonize the country, you needed three things. You needed an orchestra and you needed a narrative of the people and you needed a proper infrastructure. And he really honed in on narrative of the people, which is Mm-hmm. You need the play to be about Jamaicans. You need the stories mm-hmm. to be about Jamaicans. And so at that four, three years later, the Ward Theater came online and the Ward Theater is an opera house of, of a little bit under a thousand seats. And it was gifted to the country after um, a big earthquake, um, of a great earthquake of uh, 09, Evene. And, um, and so it is the, 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 the seminal theater of, of the country. And Shaw visits in 11 and he criticizes the Eurocentrism of the theater scene in Jamaica. And then the, the Ward Theater opens. And then about 20 or 30 years later, the uh, Little Theater Movement opens. Mm-hmm. And you see a ra- what they call a racialization or a transition of the narrative of theater in Jamaica. So we, many of those um, legends are still alive. They're in their, they're octogenarians and they're um, almost centurions. And what we're looking to do is to start the conversation with these legends. And then we would go on to the playwrights. And then when we go on to the producers and the actors, right. and people like Evan A, the next generation leaders. So you get to hear more from Evan A. And we'll talk to the audience and we'll talk to the students. So we're gonna, it's all on HowlRound, right? You're going to do it on, on Sundays? Yes, yeah, Sundays. 3 p.m.? 3 p.m.? 3 p.m. Yeah. And what's so the that's start the first day? Entry. Say that again. What's the first start day? August. 16th and it will wrap up on October 18th. So it's 10 weeks, we're gonna spend, we can't, some of us can't physically travel to Jamaica, um, but we're gonna take you there for 10 weeks. Fantastic. And maybe you'll make a great book out of it with the interviews and uh, Mm. and uh, and, and find something. I just wanna plug- We can help you, yeah. I wanna Mm -hmm. plug a great book that already exists by um, Wyclef Bennett and Hazel Bennett. It's called The Jamaican Stage, Jamaican Theater. So if you wanted mm-hmm. to know, I would say open this great book first. Okay. An incredible book. <laughs> well, but these interviews will be significant and I'm so, so happy that you're doing it. You know, you archive the presence, you archive the history and it will make an enormous contribution and raise awareness. And it's such a great, uh, a great uh, place that Jamaica has been there and it also has a lot to learn. I mean, a lot still, um, you can make a big contribution. I know that the les- gay, lesbian, and LGBT community is having a hard time yeah. for historical reasons, but it's good that theater helps with imagination. You can imagine a different present, a different future, and theater is one of the few things that that really can, um, can be um, doing that as always, and we should talk much longer. And again, thank you for, for coming on also on the um, short notice and um, and uh, so um, what advice, I mean, you gave already so much, but still as a final question, both of you, what's the advice for young theater maker? What's the advice for our audience? What's the meaning of this time? How should we use it? Evone, if you have an idea. Okay, um, for me, going back to honor, honor the pause, find out your lesson during this pause, this time when you feel as if you can't move as you would want to. What's your lesson during this time? And also, I have to speak to my entrepreneurs because I always love to find ways. This is the moment where you pull apart your company. That's what I call it. Pull apart and look deep. Find out what is missing. 
what is needed and start planning how to put everything together. So when Corona has passed, you are strong and ready for action. Yeah. Yeah, I like what you said. Why the pause, right? Yeah. Oh, no, the, the pause, pause yeah. the why, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Akiba. I say take Evanay's advice. <laughs> <laughs> 100 percent take Evanay's advice. She's she's incredible. Um, and the audience, I'm gonna say make noise. I need the audience mm -hmm. to make a lot of noise because mm -hmm. we theater makers, we are here to amplify your voices. And so we need to hear from you. Make noise. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, forget, right. for forget. Frank, thank you so much for this. I've been watching also your talks with us different persons. And I've been learning so much about theater across the world. I know we've been doing this for Corona, but my God, I'm learning about um, structures in countries, what's going on with their governments. I'm like, whoa, this is so amazing. So thank you for this platform. These discussions you're having are so meaningful. Let me tell you. Thank you, thank you. That, <clears throat> that does mean a lot to us and your work is of significance, both of you and we care about you and uh, we are behind you and there's all the expressions of mankind, the utterings, uh, you know, to make the noise as Akiba said, you know, you have a drum, uh, use your drum and uh, use it and dance and uh, uh, be part as the Buddhists say in a joyful participation in the sorrows of life. And I think this is what theater does. We are on the side of life. And, um, and I think we uh, are more needed um, than ever. And what you both are talking about is very inspiring. I found that uh, significant and also um, a tone and a message we normally do not hear. So really, really thank you both for taking the time um, being with us. This week uh, comes uh, to a close. And, uh, and next week, again, we will continue our um, our journey around the globe, around the world, and you will be the first to hear it. I, I barely just learned it today because we finally confirmed the next one today. We're going to hear from Kenya uh, on Monday, Karishma Bagani and Anmota and Sitave Nambali. They will talk about how to perhaps find a way to combine African history, American ideas of music and theater, melodrama, or musical with uh, storytelling, and how they can do it as both of you said, how do we tell our own stories? How do we sing our own songs? And we don't do karaoke, which is never as good as the original. Sometimes, very few, but sometimes. But uh, sing your own song. And uh, on Tuesday, we have Emily Monet and Greg Hill, both from the indigenous community in Canada. So we're going to hear from them. Uh, Emily is a great uh, writer, player, director about how they're doing a Canadian Native uh, American Indigenous women having a hard time. Still, many of them are disappearing. There's violence. And, um, and also, so much hasn't been addressed of the Indigenous people of the country who were here. As you said, theater was before us. They were before the theater came, and perhaps the first pipes they smoked uh, around this was the very beginning of American theater and the ceremonies and the dances, the sun dances. And it's been overlooked and is a, a significant uh, part of it. Uh, Wednesday, we go to Japan. Satoko Ishihara, a young writer, a very uh, idiosyncratic, uh, authentic uh, uh, a writer. I like her work very much. Uh, it's kind of a post post feminism uh, writing performance. Also, she performs her solo performance of strong women. She's a hard time also in Japan. We like her very much and others, but she also is pushing boundaries. She does transgressions. I think it's of importance. Nigel Smith, the, who runs the great Flea Theater in New York City and how uh, he is going through that. He took over uh, from Jim Simpson, who was the husband of Sigourney Weaver. He took over a theater that was not a traditional black theater. He's a black director. And uh, how does he navigate the world all of a sudden? He is in charge of things and he has to deal with things he has maybe not so much to do with, but everybody now looks at him as a leader, but he's also a black man. So what's, what does that mean? And what does he try to uh, make sense out of this time um, of Corona? And then we have Friday, uh, Jean-Glaude van Italy. He's uh, uh, originally from Belgium, a refugee from uh, the camps from World War II. And he came to... America and had his first great works actually at La Mama with Alan Stewart. He wrote the most significant anti-Vietnam play, America Hoorah, and many other things. 
um, it's a, a successful writer who now moved upstate New York, created Shantiga, a farm, and things. One of the things we also have to think about is meditation, is you know changing ourselves and trying to see the world how it is, not just through our minds, but perhaps to get closer to it. But also, he's a great theater maker. His work on the Book of the Dead, and which might be even more significant now than before. Is so are we going to hear from someone who spent a lifetime in theater? in a lifetime thinking about it. So it will be, uh, it, I think it will be again an interesting um, week. And um, thanks to our listeners for staying with us. We went a little bit over time, but I thought Evone and Akiva really had significant things to say. And it's important that they know that people care, that people think this is important what you do, the knock, knock at the wallet. And Bogart said, you know, say, say hey, how are you doing in Jamaica? And for you now being in, that's important for us, for you, but also for our listeners. And there's something in there, maybe what Yvonne and Akiba said, it will be of significance for you to change your life in an authentic way. And we have, as both of you said, we have to change ourselves and use this pause for the why, who are we, where do we come from, as both of our guests said today. So it is significant. It's actually all about us. And uh, thanks to HowlRound for hosting us, HowlRound for taking on Akiba's 10-day a journey through the yeah. Jamaican theater and the living history of it. It's a great company out of Emerson and for everybody who is wondering what significant role education plays, how universities can influence, how can connect young artists, scholars, um, listening to Akiba's story and Ebony, here you have the proof. It's uh, about transferring knowledge and then performing the knowledge. And then what do you do with the knowledge? And to be taught that you have to do something with it, it's not good enough. Because if it would be, the librarians would be the smartest people in the world and make the most money because they have all the books. But no, you have to do something with it. Even so, most librarians I know are super, super smart people and they know and do a lot. So it's just a symbolic way. I, I said that again, thank you all for listening. Um, thanks to my Siegel team, Sam Young and Andy at HowlRound, Sia, Travis and uh, Vijay. And both of you, thank you for coming on our program and have a great 4th of July. Do wear a mask. It is of significant. Yes. It does help. Yes. Uh, this is what we know at the moment. Things are getting ugly in the States and we have still a very low percentage of only a couple of one, two, three percent of people who had this. Herd immunity would be 70 percent. Um, and that uh, would be devastating. They have the number of cases connected to it. So um, let's try to be careful on the safe side and, um, and prepare, as both of them said, let's prepare what I call TAC, the time after Corona. So uh, here we go, as uh, the great uh, um, Eugenio Barber said, it was on the program, the moment when you shoot an arrow, but it's not the significant one, the moment before when you concentrate, when you think about it, when you aim, that's the moment. And uh, so we are in one of those. So thank you all and see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.